So as you make your way to the seats, so AV, AV people, can you real quick put my very last slide with the QR code on there? Did you do that for me? Because I meant to click on that earlier and I didn't, but can you go all the way to the end so I don't have to do that? All right, so if you want free stuff, you want to know our stuff, you want the PowerPoints, you want all this, pull out your phones. If you register here, all this does, we won't spam you, but once we get done with South Africa, we're going to send all our talks, all our PowerPoints, the devotional, the 40 weeks of wisdom that we've done. Um, I've given out all the copies I can. Um, we have all of our graphics, infographics, everything that you need. Uh, this is where you'll get it. And the classicalvirtueacademy.com, that's where we're, we're teaching things like the virtue and the discipleship in these courses, where we're actually going to be starting in these, these courses. Uh, they're on there right now, like there's, in a sense, on demand, but we're going to be doing live courses starting in August. So that's another thing where if you email me, thomas at familiesofvirtue.com, and you want the South African membership, such to get in for the South African prices, that's what we want to do. We wanted to make it easy for you, and I have done, and John will attest that I have painstakingly asked, what, what, what is that, how does that work in the South African economy such that you offer just a little investment such that you, you get from that great reward? Um, because I want to help families, and, and we're a homeschool family, so that means that we have to pay for all our curriculums, all our things, and I get it. Uh, I get it. I, there, there's economic burden, um, so we don't want it to be burdensome. We don't want to put our stuff behind this paywall and maximize profits. We're a ministry, not a business. And so we want to help you. And um, But like I said, at the same time, we also like to pay our bills. So that's why um, if I could get donors tomorrow that would cover everything, we, we would be able to scholarship people. It wouldn't be a problem with us. That's what we want to do. Um, so, so we're excited to be able to help and, and do these kinds of things. So you can go back to the, the original. I'll have it up again at the, at the end. So we're going to talk about uh, virtuous fatherhood. Now that you've gotten your crash course on virtue and you're just like kind of reeling from this, you're like, that's a lot. Um, we're going to apply this. So you're going to get some of the same ideas and you're going to keep seeing the terms so that way you can sort of learn the vocabulary. You can learn kind of how this, this works. And this is not the case that for ladies that you get to check out. So I don't know if I lost any ladies. I did notice that the, the door was locked, which I love. I wish we could do that at our church. That's amazing. The fact you can lock, like, that's so good. Like, you have no idea. Um, and now it's being open. So somebody's escaping. So the pastor has to go track them down. You know, as I say that, somebody's rattling. No, get me out. But... Um, Ladies, this, this, uh, it's, it's focused indirectly with fathers, but the, the thing that I've, I've said, we've reclaimed these ideas, they're cross-compatible in many ways, that it is not the case that there's an entirely different set of virtues for men and women, for mothers and fathers. It's the same virtues, they just apply differently. And that's why, uh, and I, I am, as a pastor, I'm so familiar having to preach Mother's Day sermons when I'm preaching to moms. And I'm like, you know, what do I know? And so I'll always begin. I was like, well, my wife and I, when we gave birth, and uh, of course my wife is down there. She's like, we, we, and she's very quick. And I'm, I'm honest. I almost passed out. Um, watching my wife go through all that pain, I just couldn't, you know. So, so it just, I, I got, I got all lightheaded. And, um, and to be honest, I'll give my wife credit. All three births, by the way, she was too, too quick. Not a single drop of medication. All three were full-on naturals. They didn't even give her Tylenol. Like, no, none of little pay. Like, it was too late. She went quick. And um, so do I have respect for my wife and what she could do? Oh, yeah. Is that why I almost passed out? Oh, yeah. Like, that's... There's a difference when your wife is like, you know, like you should get the epidural and everything's fine. And like, you know, the doctor sends you a Snapchat of the baby and you're like, oh, look, we have a baby now. Um, we, we knew like everything was going on. So you talk about fortitude, you talk about those things. It's not a different set of virtues. It's just applied differently. It's just applied differently. So we're going to understand the unique role of fathers because as we just had Father's Day, as we've just gone through, um, and, and we, we see this, what happens so much in the the gay and lesbian community is a lack of fathers. You see this among the atheists. All your major philosophical atheists had horrible relationships with their fathers. It's critical. It's the father is critical because part of what we've learned, the world wants to neutralize the church. Amen? 
Well, the way you're going to do that is you're going to attack the family. And to kill the family, you strike at the head, which is the father. And that's what we've seen. That's what we saw coming out of America with uh, Black Lives Matter. They had it on their, I got those screenshots, their initial um, statement of beliefs. Their goal was to end the nuclear family because nuclear families are racist. Okay. Actually, one of the fun things, I just want you to understand, families of virtue, I've been told, families are racist, virtue is racist, so apparently I'm a racist. Okay, so I'm cool with that. Um, it's not racism. It may not be typical in our world, but that's a problem. We're trying to fix that. And so uh, they knew, though, if you get rid of the, the family, the kids then are then raised by the state. You put them in an environment, you can shape them however you want to. Families are the last bastion against that. Families prevent that from happening because they can always go back and they can always be um, detoxed. They can always be sort of uh, debriefed and, and, and fix that. So we got to understand what we're, what we're dealing with. So Ephesians 5, 22 through 23 we're familiar with the, ver the verse, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself his savior. Now, it's funny when, when I give this verse and people look at it, and, and this word submit always gets, gets uh, people twitchy. And I said, listen, Paul tells us in the church we're to submit to one another. Do we have any problems with that? So when we come to the, the household and it says, wives should submit to husbands, do we have any problems? And all of a sudden we got, well, are, you know, it's not supposed to boss me around. Well, no, he's not supposed to boss you around. We don't do that in church, or at least you're not supposed to. If you do, stop that. But you're not, I mean, the, the pastor is the, the head of the church. You submit to the pastor, and like we're okay with that. But you know, the pastor doesn't come along and say, you know what? I really don't like what you're wearing right now. You need to change that. You know, or just, I mean, it's sitting boss you around. We're, we're so good at corrupting this and so good at overcomplicating it. Bottom line, however else we say it, um, I take it as my responsibility as the father of my household that whatever goes on in the house ultimately falls on me. I'm responsible. Okay, so that's why I have that charge. I know that when my wife, who is the homeschooling parent, when she's homeschooling and she's, she, she gets upset because she didn't teach my son math very well this, this last year is what she said. And I said, well, I share that burden with you. She's like, you didn't do anything. You didn't do the teaching of the math. I was like, no, but I'm responsible. It's my job to make sure. And it's my job to make sure you have what you need to make that happen. And I must have failed you somehow. And that's my fault. And she, she'll, she'll do this thing. Don't make it about you. I was like, no, no, I'm not making it about me. God has given me this, this, this responsibility. I don't get to shirk that off on you. I can't blame you. It's my job to make sure you as the mom have what you need to thrive and succeed. It falls back on me because that's what God did with Adam and Eve. Eve, who came from the rib, not from the foot that he would step on her, not from the head she would roll over, but to stand by side. But when it came down to it, who was responsible? It was the sin comes through Adam. It's because Adam fell that we all have that sin nature and why the second Adam had to come and fix that. You with me? So when it comes to my, my family, I, I take it seriously. And it took years for me to kind of figure this out because no one told me. No one explained to me how this was supposed to work, and I had no godly examples. This is the other thing. You want to write this down because it's not in any PowerPoint. I want you to understand that virtue is taught, sought, and caught. You have to teach what is right. You have to live as that example. And then the person who's learning, they must seek it. This is why parents, two out of three is your responsibility. You can sort of draw that to them. But for me, I didn't have, no one taught me, and I didn't have any good examples. So when I got into being a, being a husband, that's why I stunk so bad at it. I didn't understand. And even when I went into ministry, I said, my family is my first ministry. I said that when I went into ministry, and I, I was called to ministry 2001, went into seminary 2003. It was probably 2013 when I was at a conference, and I hit my knees weeping because I realized for over a decade I'd been saying my family is my first ministry, but I wasn't living it. And it took a stranger at a conference to point that out to me. We need community. We need each other to highlight these things, to show us. One of the things I learned about my children is that my children reflect my sin really well. So I learned a lot about myself. Do they not? I mean, that when they start doing what you do, because they will, they'll pick it up. 
you know, I'm supposed to treat my wife with, res with respect. And I just jokingly with her, you know, I use Jesus's words when my wife says something. I said, woman, because that's what Jesus said to his, to his mom. He's like, woman, what does this have to do with me? So woman. So one day my five-year-old looks at my, looks at my wife, woman, I did that. That's my bad. He caught that. Sorry. We'll fix that. And so I don't do that anymore. I realized, hmm, they're going to treat their mommy the way I treat mommy. They're going to treat their wives the way I treat my wife. It's so critical to provide that example. So again, the world, often means Satan, seeks to sterilize the church. This requires destroying the families. If it can kill the head, it will devour the body. This is what the world, again, seeks to do. And I would say the world is doing a really good job of it. In culture, the man is, the, the father is an idiot. In the, in the sitcoms, name a sitcom where the dad actually has his act together. Only I can think of one, Bluey. You know Bluey? Some of you are like, no. It's like an Australian cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, anyone said Bluey. Yeah, I know Bluey. It's great. Um, it's, it's a cartoon. It's uh, Australian cattle dogs that, like, again, there's one's blue, so they call it Bluey. One's cinnamon, so they call it cinnamon. I mean, it's pretty simple. But um, the dad is not an idiot. I mean, the family is actually functional. It's so wholesome and good. And, and like, I look at this like, how did this come out of Australia? But you, you, you examine this and you, and you see, and it's like the only thing I know of. The dad is always out of touch, idiot, you know, that, that there's no real connection. And this is, and I even remember growing up, that's all I ever saw on TV. That was all I ever knew, and that's what I felt. And so the, the kids growing up, they don't have that. And I'm going to try not to get passionate. I get real upset on this one. I don't know <laughs> in strongest possible terms if you're a grandparent and you have that mentality that your kids, that your grandkids are coming to you so you can spoil them, you stop that. Why in the world have we set up a system where grandparents spoil their grandkids? Why not Nana and Papa, or whatever y'all call your grandparents, why are they not the seed of wisdom of the family? Why is it that when you're struggling, when your kids are struggling and, and you don't know what to do, somebody says, let's ask grandpa, he'll know what to do. Let's ask grandma. I want to be like grandma when I go up, grow up, but they don't want to. They just want to go to grandma because they get the candy, they get the sweets, they get the spoiling. I tell you, I've often said, I, t I, say, I speak in so many American churches, our, our elderly members of our churches are, are our least tapped resource in the church. You have wisdom, you have life, you have lived through things that in some ways I cannot imagine, and there's so much that's there. Do not spoil. Do not be that kind of, be the kind of family that, they, that the children can look up to you and they have a multiplicity of examples that they can grow into. And the grandparents, most of all, you should be that. Like I say, it's, it's one of those things that burdens me so bad because that's what we end up thinking about the whole older generation. Why do we, why do we so, as, a ch as churches, look down upon the older generation? Because they're only good for spoiling us. We've taught them that. Let's change that. Okay. Okay. Done with that. So... <clears throat> In no uncertain terms, let's be clear. So fatherlessness, it impacts United States and South Africa. Throw these up there. When you look, if you can read it, you may not be able to. That's okay. 60% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 63% uh, of the youth who commit suicide in South Africa from fatherless. We're kind of like, like back and forth on this. 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes in the U.S., 70% uh, in the juvenile state institutions in South Africa. You got 71% 71 71 versus 85% in America with uh, the high school dropout behavioral problems. 90% of all homeless and runaway children in both South Africa and America come from fatherless homes. It's a huge impact. Coming from a two-parent family where the father is present dramatically increases a child's success rate just to thrive, to have that. And I say that, that to have a father present because sometimes there, there's a guy there, but he's not present. 
And that's a, that's a, another another issue for another day. But to be there, that f- this is why um, a friend of mine, some of you, I don't know if you know Simon Brace. Um, he's with Ratio Christie. You should get, if if you know Simon, you know Simon, and you understand. Um, but Simon, he's he's just this 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 interesting, boisterous character. And I'm sitting in his living room because we went to Potrasturum. Potrasturum. Poch. Okay, I'll just go with Poch. So I'm working on it. We I go there. I go to Simon's house. And the thing about Simon is he starts talking, I'll put this way. And he starts talking, he's, he's just like, here's the pride. He's, he's going at it, and he's boisterous, he's big, and he's loud, and he's talking to these first year students at the college, and they're just, <laughs> they're just, and he's, uh, and then here comes little, his son, little Ruben, five years old, with his, with his, um, I believe it was a helicopter. I think that's what he was trying to make. And he comes over, and Simon just stops, oh, Ruben, you know, and he just focuses right there with Ruben deals with it. Here's what you need. You got to make this stronger. This is too floppy out here. Reuben goes on. What I was saying, and he just gets right back to it. He, sh- he just, I looked at this and I said, it seems so small, but how many dads? And I looked at that and I was like, oh, Holy Spirit check. I don't do that with my kids. I looked at it. I was like, all right, I'm going to fix that when I get home. We need fathers who are present. So let's investigate. What are we dealing with with this? To put it in simplest terms, lack of self-identity, self-worth, that's going to lead to suicide. They don't know what they're worth. And they need parents. They need people who communicate that to them because what happens is the world either tells them they're worthless or the world only tells them they have worth if they have a certain orientation. Because that's what that's that's why so many teenagers. This is a problem in the United States. I don't know if it's here, but we have so many middle school girls that all of a sudden decide that they're boys or or are lesbians because everybody's standing around. You want attention? Just come out of the closet. Everybody, like all of a sudden, flocks around you, and they're getting their self worth. This is why I said, like the generation coming up, they have no sense of clothing style. I mean, I know I, I see what I wear. I get it. But teenagers, usually, there was always a style. The 60s had a style. Some of you are like, yeah, we did. I wasn't born yet. The 70s, they had a style. Some of you are like, yeah, we did. I'm still not born yet. So the 80s had a style. I was born in the 80s. So in the 80s, it was bad style, okay? But we had it. At least we had something. The 90s, as a teenager, grunge, I get it. I was a part of it. We got our identity from our clothing. The 2000s, we don't have really a style. Look at the kids. They're just recycling everything. That's because they no longer get their identity from their clothing. They get it from their sexuality. No understanding of the law. Therefore, there's going to be no respect for justice, pride, and this state, oper- state operating facilities are what's guiding this. They don't understand the concept of everything is self-centered. Even when I was in college, I told you, that you, you for those of you who heard, I did a minor in speech and theater. So one of the classes I took was interpersonal communication. It's literally how to interact with people. Okay? I also took a class called voice and diction, which was how to use your voice. I paid money for these. And so... I took this class on interpersonal communication, and I get in there, and I'm told I need to communicate my needs. I need to make sure people understand my autonomy and my time, and I need to, I need to make sure I set boundaries, and everybody res- respects my boundaries. Now, I took this class in the fall of 2001. In the spring of 2001, okay, well, actually, let's see, in reverse, like our spring comes before our fall. I know for you guys, it gets confusing. So um, in the earlier in 2001, I got married. Later 2001, I take this class. So you know what I did as a young married man? I need my autonomy. You're infringing on my space. I took what I was learning in my, I was in my classes. I took it and I put it into practice. Now, some of you ladies are like, you know, I can tell you what you can do with that autonomy. And my wife was the same way. She was like, what are you married for? If you're like, put, but my boundaries, you got to respect my boundaries. This is me. And this is how the first couple of years of our marriage went. And I still to this day have no idea why my wife stayed with me. I was, I was wretched and I had the, the school system played into my vices and my selfishness, my self-centeredness, my, my everything I wanted. It played right into that. And I had no sense, I had no sense of justice. 
seeing people as objects to exploit. And this is where we get the problems of exploitation and rape. Lack of self-control and restraint. We have behavioral problems. And overall fail, failure to thrive. This is what we're looking at, what comes from the fatherlessness. And we see this in our society. We see this across the board. And part of it is, the, is, is again, and I understood this growing up, I didn't have good examples. I didn't know. What does it mean to be a man? I had TV and movies to teach me. I didn't know otherwise. This void that fatherlessness, fatherlessness leaves. Fatherless children likely do not know that they are intrinsically valuable. We see this as one of the problems. This is what we're dealing with. Fatherless children tend towards injustice. They, they only worry about the sounds. I have to take care of myself. They don't know what it's like in that sense when the father sacrifices. And for me to sacrifice for my children, my, fa- my children will actually see that. And they know that I'm giving to them because I'm showing them what it means to love someone else more than I love myself. And I target these things. But if you never see that, it's going to be all about you. It's going to be all about your needs, your desires. Fatherless children likely do not know that others are intrinsically valuable too. Because who will teach them? Who will show them this? The fatherless children, they lack self-control. And with fatherlessness, they're going to lack courage. Every cardinal virtue here. Actually, in this case, it's the cardinal vices. They don't know what's good. Injustice, they have intemperance, and they lack fortitude. There's no virtue. Virtue is what makes us human. And what's happening in our societies, and this is why people say, well, people act more like animals than they do humans. And you're not wrong, because this is what animals do. This is how animals act. We actually, uh, if, you, if you get on our social media, you'll see that I, I went in uh, Johannesburg and we uh, walked with lions, if you've ever gotten to do that. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen the walk with lions? Oh, it's so much fun. Because we're American, we don't know better. So we feel... You know, like, like we just, we're going to go do walk with lions, okay? So we get out there, and um, we decide that, that we're going to do this, and they're talking about the lions, and they're talking about what happens in nature and how things work, and we're learning about the lions, and we learn about the hyenas, and we learn about this because, you know, we get to see them. Um, we got to pet a cheetah. That was fun. Um, last time I was here in 2019... And I've told this was stupid. John and I got to pet a leopard, um, you know, and, and people, so, people told me, don't do that. And I was like, well, I don't know that the guide was doing it. You know, what do I know? But we're learning, and we're learning, you know, the cubs, they get eaten a lot. And, um, you know, I tell the guy, like, well, I've got kids, and, you know, I see the way they act, and sometimes I get it. You know, so, so I, I understand this. Um, but the, the, the cubs, bad things happened, you know, nature takes its course, lions can't survive, a lot of death, a lot of, you know, the, the older lions get kicked out and they die of starvation, and you're listening to this, and it's, nature runs its course, right? We look at that, and that's, that's nature. It's unforgiving. There's no virtue to the animals. They have no morality. They just act according to their desires. They have an impulse. So that's why, that was almost effective just then. They, um, when, when, when the lion comes in, he takes over, he kills all the little cubs to make the female lions go back and eat so he can have cubs. We look at that, and again, as humans, we're like, oh, if humans did that, that's horrible. That's immoral. But for the animals, it's just Darwin, by the way. In our schools, Darwinian evolution, that's what you get, survival of the fittest. It's what's so odd to me when people talk about, you know, racism is wrong, but they're cool with Darwinian evolution. Darwin himself said that, and I love quoting it, Darwin said that it would be the white man that would bring the gorilla, the aborigine, and the negro to extinction. Understand what Darwinian evolution gets you. There's no, there's no world of justice. There's no world where racism is wrong. It's actually right in a Darwin world because survival of the fittest. You hear a lot of conversations about oppressor and oppressed because of CRT. That's exactly the way it should be in an atheistic Darwinian world, by the way, because we're just animals of a higher order. But the thing is, we're not just animals of a higher order. We're made in the image of God. And we have a morality. And what's happening when the children grow up and something is, and they grow up without this direction, bad things happen. 
One of the more interesting stories I like, if you're familiar with the the story of the Jungle Book, and um, you know, and the, the the Disney version makes it look all that's actually based upon a true story. A kid that was found out in the wild. It happened with a kid that was raised in the wild, and there's another case of a girl who was um, in the states. The girl in the states was like her dad when she when she became a little bit older. He just basically tied her to this chair and just left her, and she had like zero human contact. And this happened until I think she was like seven years old. So she never developed language. She could not communicate with people. And once they found her and they began working with her, and they could never get her to talk. Something was so broken in her through this disconnect that there was, there was almost no way to salvage. And, and what happened, she eventually, her family got her and she went off the radar. So we don't know what happened. The, uh, the other boy, he sort of developed some competency, but never really, as we would think, becomes like truly human. And that's because he missed out on all that development. And what's happening in our families when they don't have the institute that God has given them with a mother and father to help them develop it, this is why they're developing the way they are. Well, so we can like literally scientifically prove this, but also God has told us spiritually, this is, this is part of the problem. So fatherlessness has led to a, to a centuries-long spiritual pandemic, a true pandemic. And it's been going on for a very long time. Thus, what we face, and that went away, fathers in general have shirked their biblical responsibility to lead their homes. In general. Now, some of you might be saying, you don't know my household. If that's the case, amen. Like, I am, I am so glad for that. But I believe it's the case so often, and even in the case of my, like, my wife and I, we were married in 2001. We didn't have children until 2010, okay? And that was because I was getting my master's, and I said, you know what? I need to get my degree. I want to keep my wife home. We want we wanted to do this. I look back, and I realize what God was doing was protecting my children because I didn't have a fat clue what it meant to be a husband, and I didn't, definitely didn't know what it meant to be a father. And even when I became a father, I'm still like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, you know, we're just kind of winging this. They don't come with a manual. Um, but God was maturing me so that way I could become the father my kids needed. In some ways, I would say God was protecting my children. And I realize this now. And, and even now, I, th I would think even just recently, I feel like I've, I've, I'm growing in this and I understand my biblical responsibility, and I've got a I've got a twelve year old going on thirteen. I got an eight year old. I got a five year old, and I feel like maybe I can make a good go of this now. It's just taken that long. Part of it's the shirking, but part of it again goes back to if you're never told, you don't know. These shirked responsibilities have led to many devastating social issues and a bleak spiritual isolation. My time in youth ministry, I see these kids who just want their parents' attention. They just want love. And I'll be honest, there was a, a family I was counseling one time. They were having severe problems with their daughter. And I'm just like getting in there trying to figure out what's going on. I love the family, love the daughter. I get in there and I'm talking with the mom and she's telling me all this. And I said, um, so I said, I have a question. Because remember, if you were here this morning, let's ask questions. Here's the question I asked her. Do you ever tell your daughter that you love her? And she stopped as she looked at me. She says, listen, you don't understand. You do. I was like, no, no. Do you ever tell your daughter you love her? She's like, I can't. Okay, we're at the heart of this. No wonder the daughter's acting out like she does. I'm not asking that you to like her. People can be very unlikable. You still love them unless we have a conditioned love, and then we don't know the love of Christ, okay? I find out she doesn't, she's not telling her daughter she loves her. She's not communicating love. No wonder she's acting out. So fathers need to step up and wear that crown they've been given. So again, this is why mothers, you're not out of the picture, but we're talking about fathers. What is that crown you've been given? What is the, this responsibility? How does this play out? And some of you as fathers, you might be thinking, you know, well, my kids are almost grown. What can I do? You can become the kind of father that they're going to need in their adulthood. Why not? Why not start now? Why, 
we, we have this mentality sometimes like, well, you know, things have gone kind of bad, so, you know, we're just going to keep doing it bad. Like, what? Why do that? It's, it's almost like, you know, if I'm, okay, what are the names of the South African shoes you like to wear so much, those leather shoes? Phillies? Phillies. Phillies. Okay. So I went to a shoe store and I tried those on. I'm like, this is a blister waiting to happen. So, I mean, I appreciate that's part of your culture. I was like, but I wear half sizes. So they like, like, it's either too big or too small on me. So, so legitly that my foot's the problem. I get it. So, but I, I, I try these on and, you know, it's, it's like if I bought it and I start wearing it, I was like, man, I'm getting blisters, you know, but you know, I'm already halfway through the day. Why not just keep wearing them? You know, I could say, but you know, I'm like, I'm already, you know, what? just keep wearing them. And the blister gets worse and worse. Why not change your shoes? Why not fix the problem? And again, we, we think, what? well, I've already invested all this money in these, these shoes. And I, we, we, I see so many families where this is the case. And it's like, if you have figured this out, even if your kids are adult and grown, they're going to need grandparents. They're going to need wisdom. They're going to need this. Be, start becoming this if you figure it out. And this is what I encounter with so many people. Like, well, I, it's so late in the game. I'm so late in the game. I'm, and why is that an excuse not to grow in the Lord? It's like the person who's like 55 years old and says, you know what? I've lived, lived this long without Jesus. Why do I need him now? Why bother changing now? And most of us in here would be like, of course you would want to change now. Well, yeah, but I live 55 years old. What, what good could I possibly do? And you're like, that doesn't matter. You need Jesus and he will change you for the rest of your life, whatever that is. I mean, one of the more, more inspiring things I have at my Bible college, it's uh, not a traditional campus. Um, I started teaching there 13 years ago. I was 30 years old, and I was always the youngest person in class. It was all these older people. Our average age is 45. And when these, the, this last lady, 84 years old, got her degree. Love it. And what people do, what are you supposed to do with that? I said she's going to use it the rest of her life. Just like anyone else, right? She's going she's gonna to focus on the quality of her time, not the quantity. Families, focus on quality, not quantity. Focus on that quality. So how, how to wear the crown. We can talk about what does, what does the virtues in a father look like? Here we go. In wearing the crown, influential leaders really listen. And we talked about this earlier. It keeps coming back to it, doesn't it? The influential leaders really listen. A father really listens. For me to listen to my children, and my wife sometimes when I'm working and I'm busy because apparently whatever I'm doing is way more important than my family. At least that's what I'm communicating. My wife says, look at your child. So sometimes I used to have a bad attitude. I don't anymore. Put my stuff down and I focus. Let me get a light so I can really make like eye contact, make y'all feel uncomfortable. I really look, I really engage, really listen. It means so much. And I think back to my childhood when I, when I wasn't listened to and I was crying out for attention, just listening. It makes the, like so much happens. Listen, husbands, listen to your wives. Now, I know we joke and like he doesn't listen and if somebody else, let's see. Somebody else made that joke earlier, like, well, he's a man, so you can only do so much. But I get it. I get it. Um, and, and I, men, we, we, we have our particular issues. But especially the man who really listens, isn't that somebody you want to be around? Don't you like that when somebody really hears you? And you've ever, you've ever been around the kind of person you talk to, but they don't listen at all? Like you talk, but they're not registering what you're saying? Don't elbow people. That's not nice. Um, <laughs> you understand, like... It's important. It's prudent. It's knowing how to do the right thing the right way. It's knowing how to take your priorities. And, and this is what we need from our fathers. And again, I'm not, when, when we consider, you mean like, really listen. That's what I have to go home and do. Like, yes. It, it begins the process because whatever you're dealing with is very particular to your family. So if you're not listening, you have no idea how to lead. Honest leaders do not lie. Now, there is a difference between being an honest person and being someone who does not lie. Because an honest person is honest from a place of virtue because there's a sense that we owe people the truth. Someone who simply doesn't lie, it's just not practical. 
Or, you know, like, this is what we teach our kids. Don't lie because you want people to believe you. That's the kind of person, they're not honest. They're a person who just simply doesn't lie because it works better for them. That's Machiavelli. That's not Christ. When it comes to being like Christ, we need to be honest because we owe people the truth. That's why we're honest, because it's good. Not simply because we want people to believe us, not because it gets us better things or people think better of us and all the other things we tend to tell our children. We tell the truth because people deserve the truth, because we are good people. We are like Christ. We do what is right from a place of virtue. And I use this language all the time. The brave leaders do not compromise the truth. That's fortitude. And you're going to face that sometimes in your family. You're going to face where, you know, well, let me see if I can get around and, you know, and I can, uh, or you're just afraid and you do something in order to make extra money. Whatever it is, the things we face, we have to, we have, to have that fortitude. And you have to have fortitude in many ways before you encounter the situation. That if you come to a situation and you don't have any fortitude and you say, now I shall have my courage. And what are you going to do? Put it on? You're going to like strap that on somehow? You're going to like take that courage and stick that on? What are you going to do? When uh, Joshua 1, Jesus, or, or God comes to Joshua, says, uh, be strong and courageous. You're going into the land. Well, Joshua had spent 40 years with these yahoos lapping this mountain, dealing with them. So by the time he gets here, he knows what he's up against, which is why I think God's coming to him saying, be strong and courageous. I'm with you. But here's Joshua who has seen God be with Israel that whole time. Joshua is now the leader. He's the head. God said, I will be with you, and you can go in the land. You can do this. But see, he'd already been developing. He'd already been cultivating. He'd been mentored by Moses. He was ready. And then he had to put it into practice. This is what we need in our families, those dads who, uh, who will not compromise. Compassionate leaders can sympathize with other needs, and that's temperance. We're able to moderate our own desires, our own passions, our own appetites, because we sympathize. I look and I understand. I may not like it, but I can go and I can do what needs to be done because I'm no longer just interested in my own needs. And I serve my family. And I serve, I can serve because I know how to put my desires, my passions on hold. That's what temperance allows me to do. If I've cultivated that, I can do that quickly, easily, and with joy. That's what it means to be virtuous, to do the good thing, to do the right thing quickly, easily, and with joy. Isn't that what makes a good person? The answer is yes. I can see you enough that, you know, you, 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 come on, stay with me. We're almost done here. This is what we need to see from our fathers. That's what would make the good father. It's not just the father that is the martyr. See, this is what I learned in my, my, my family taught me how to play the martyr. Okay, fine. I will give this up for you. I don't have to have this. You know, I don't need this. You take it. I'll just sit here and suffer. Oh, I learned how to play the martyr. My wife quickly, you know, nipped that thing. She was like, we're not going to play that game. You do not get to be a martyr. Same result, very different motives. One comes from a place of virtue. The other comes from a place of vice. Now, the influential leaders, we talk about they really listen. So we're going to sort of hash these out real quick. The prudent father never divides the attention when his wife or his children speak. Now, again, you look at this, you're like, and again, if something is really coming, crashing down, is destroying the family, this is where you tell them. What you do is you're like, hold on, not right now. Let me deal with this. You've dealt with it. Now you can focus the attention. Prudence tells you how to decide which is which. I think that was the thing. Every movie in the 90s, it was a dad's like, you know, I realize, you know, I run this whole corporation and like everything depends on us and our whole livelihood. But yes, I'll take off work and go to the baseball game. Like it's this, there's a, there's a level of prudence that comes to this that you decide what is right at those times. It must be practiced. Prudent father learns to actively listen when the family speaks. A prudent father can summarize what the other person says before he responds to them. When my five-year-old's telling me these things, like, so let me get this right. Let me, let me feed back to you to make sure I understand what's going on. This is what we also do in evangelism. Oh, you, so you say you're a Buddhist. You say, let me, let me, let me state these. Let me, let, me, let me summarize where we are to make sure I've understood and you can figure out where you're wrong. Doesn't that help with communication? Doesn't it help in your family when you can summarize? Like when your wife says 
all that she says, whether it's a little or a lot, I'm not implying anything. But when your wife says all these things and you can summarize, here's what you said, and your wife says, okay, no, that's not it, and we go again, and you like you, you do that, and you're, no, that's not what it is, you go again, but you finally get it right and you realize now we can actually communicate? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that good? And you don't have to fight all that out? Wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. James 3.17. Honest leaders do not lie. This goes back to justice. A just father does not need to lie. A just father possesses integrity. He walks in righteousness even when nobody is watching. Fathers. What you practice will come out one way or another. You act one way at work, you will spill that into the house somehow. A just father admits when he does wrong. I'm very quick to admit to my kids when I've done wrong. I have this habit, like when I do wrong, I let them know, I was wrong. I should not have done this. Even, when I, even if I get mad and yell at them, I'll come at them. I should not have yelled at you the way I did. And I don't qualify that, but you really made me mad. Like, I just shouldn't have done that. And I apologize. Now that we're done with that, let's deal with what you did. And how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? It's a beautiful thing when you're, and, and you have to do that a lot. I, again, I have one that's going into the teenage years. God bless us. O Lord, who, made, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Psalm 15, 1 through 2. Brave leaders do not compromise the truth. This is fortitude. The courageous father stands up for truth. And this is why families need apologetics. You need to know what truth is. That you, if your kids are coming to you with all these bad ideas, you need to be able to say, this is what is true, and this is, what is, why, this is why it's true, and bring them along instead of, you ain't going to do that in my house. As long as you're underneath my roof, that's not going to happen. You got to get that American robust John Wayne going, you know, it's just like really effective. Because that's what I was told with my, my dad. It was like his house, his rules. This is recorded, but I can't, I can't not say this. My father-in-law would do that too. His house, his rules. Okay, that'll, that'll come back on you. My kids, my rules. And then I was like... My family, like, and it, it, it fell back, and we had to uh, work out our issues as son-in-law and father-in-law throughout the ages. Well, and that's because, again, again, th there was there was this issue, and there were the, we were lacking in that virtue. We need to stand up for what is true, and we need to let our kids know that this is why we're doing. We're standing up not simply because it's our preferences, not because this is just just the way we are. It's because this is what is true, and we're going to fight for it. The courageous father will defend against the untruths. Courageous father knows he's a father and not his children's friend. A father is more than a friend. Not, and we want to be friends. We want, our, we want our kids to think lovely of us. And the best way that our kids will think lovely of us is when we do them right as human beings. And one day they look back and they say, thank you for what you did. My parents had two rules for me growing up. Don't make a life, don't take a life. Anything in between was fair game. Okay. That's not good. Just in case any of you are thinking that, don't do that. Some of the teens are like, that sounds great. No, that's awful. And I look back and I'm like, I wish I'd had somebody who got in my face and said, deal with it, like grow up. But no one ever really did. I got to do what I wanted to do. I just, you know, I just stayed clear. And there was a few people in my life who did that. They, they got in my face in America. They got in my grill and just, just really told me, and it hurt, and I realized man, I'm horrible. I got to fix this. And to this day, I, I talk about that, how I just wish somebody had gotten a hold of me when I was younger. That's why we need the fathers who have that courage to stand up that when your kids just get angry at you. And, and I had um, my 12-year-old my lost his stuff recently, like hormones playing ping pong with his brain. And he just started doing this little rage thing. And I looked at it, and part of my training, and this is where it comes back to virtue, because in my family, growing up, chaos, anger, bad things happened, and I learned in those midst, my emotions, I will pull those in hard. 
because in the midst of chaos, you don't need to be emotional. You need a clear head. So he starts losing his stuff. I pull straight in. I've got no emotions. My wife is freaking out. What is happening? I pulled in. I'm like, I'm watching, figure out what's going on here. And I let him, and again, I'm pretty mad at him, but I'm like, okay, once he got calmed down, we're going to deal with this. And we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And I let him know where his place was in this hierarchy. And I told him, you know, because this is, this is what happens sometimes. You have a kid that has really bad behavioral problems and becomes a threat to the family. I'm like, I will protect my family. Even if it means I have to neutralize a threat. But I also love him, so I'm not going to neutralize him unnecessarily. But this is where, again, when, when the kids are hurting each other, I'm going to make sure the kids don't hurt each other. Because the oldest did that recently. They were play, playing zombie attack, swiped my eight-year-old's legs. His, his elbow went the other way. Like, it went a pop back in. Okay, that was a really offensive gesture. Sorry. But I just realized we had to pull, up, pull, the, pull the arm back in. And I'm like, you, like, you hurt your brother. I'm going to defend my kids from each other sometimes. And in this case, I'm going to do what's best for my family, and I love you, and we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. That takes courage. It takes courage to get in their face, and it takes courage to recognize that part of what happened was I triggered that. And I had to apologize to him. And I said, we're not going to have this again. And he calmed down, and he said, okay. Even when he was real little, when I would punish him, I'd make him hug me, and I would tell him I love him. I was like, I love you. And it got to the point that when he, he would be punished, he would come on his own, hug me, and says, I love you, Daddy. And to this day, we hug after the punishment, and through the tears, and through the punishment he's still receiving, we tell each other we love each other. Correct your sons, he will give you comfort. He will also delight your soul. Proverbs 29, 17. So finally, compassionate leaders sympathize with the needs of others. This is temperance. Temperate father knows the family needs, places the family needs above his own. He does not dismiss the family's emotions because when we're self-centered, we're just interested in us. Leave me alone. Let me watch the game. Here's rugby. You guys watch rugby? Cricket? I don't understand that to begin with. Why anybody watch that? Okay. And, and you know, but I just want to watch the game. Leave me alone. I'm doing my thing. We need temperance to moderate our desires to do what is good. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So how to wield that crown? Let's finish off with this. Give you some, some ideas. What sort of habits do we possess? Now, in, in we, we talk about and we, we learn some things, and there's this thing called the dichotomy of control. Fancy word for you. You may never have word, used the word dichotomy before. It's, it's a good word. You split things into two. You die, cut it up, dichotomy. The dichotomy of control, discern what is, it, what is and is not in your control as a father. What is it that you can control? Focus only on what is under your control and do not try to control that which is outside of your control. That's as simple as it gets sometimes. You've been given the authority. If it's not under your control, quit freaking out about it. Do what you can, and I think this is why when Jesus says, don't be anxious about tomorrow, because sometimes we sit there and we just fret and fret and fret, but if you can't do anything, just chill and know if you've done all that you can, God will provide. As a, um, as a, as a father, this happened to me where we were renting a home, and they came to us and they said, guess what, we're going to sell that home and you've got to go find a new home. This was right after, or this was at the end of 2020, the housing market in America just started booming, and I could not afford anything in Fayetteville. We couldn't even afford where we were living. So I know like rand and dollars are difference. We were paying about 750 where we were. Cheapest place was like 14, 1500, double what we were paying. I said, we can't afford to live in Fayetteville. I said, we got two options. I'm gonna move in with my mother-in-law in Tennessee, I leave everything, couldn't afford to live, or God's gonna have to give us a house. I told my wife, God's going to have to give us a house if we're going to live in Fayetteville. And my wife is like, how's that going to happen? Seven days later, I get a phone call. Guy we used to go to church with, his aunt passed away. They were looking to use his house as a furlough for missionaries. They were supporting us. They said, would you like to rent from us? They were supporting us monthly. Sure, we'll go in. They said, yeah, it's the biggest house we would have ever lived in. And I was like, we can't. This, this house goes for like $1,800 in the market. A month. Can't afford to live here. He says, uh, do you want to take what, our support off rent? Do you want us to keep supporting you? So take it off rent. Best bang for the buck. 
He said, pay utilities, we'll call it even. That was at the end of 2020. We're still there. God gave us a house. That's why we're doing ministry today. See, that this doesn't happen to me. This happens to other people. That That's the stuff you read about, right? And you're looking at me, well, of course it happens to you. You're the fancy American. I'm not a fancy American, okay? I'm not. I'm telling you, what happened was I would face this decision as a father. Look, I was calling my mother-in-law and said, hey, we're coming to live with you, whether you like it or not. If God doesn't do something, you know, we got like two weeks. Get ready. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was being prudent, but God came through and we now do, we can do ministry because we live, we live rent free. Who does that? Who gets that? But we, we knew God called us to a purpose, and this in your own family. And we've had those times where we've had to walk the trial for years, but at the end, God paid off. This was just one he paid off in seven days, because he likes apparently that number. So real quick, what I want to do, time is fleeting. Switch me over to the second to last slide. What is your crown made of? We'll finish off with this. In conclusion. There we go. There's three things you can think about, three kinds of crowns, Daz, listen. You can have a paper mache crown. This is where you know what the Bible says, but your cowardice causes you not to apply it to your life. It's a cowardice, it's a difference, that's why we use the Burger King crown. It's a crown, it's paper mache. It's, it, you, you, again, you know, but you don't do. You have the fool's gold. You identify with your role as a head, but you tend to be legalistic and sometimes weaponize the Bible through imprudence and injustice. Or you can wear that crown of thorns. You listen well and place your family needs before your, before your own, and that is agape love and virtue in practice. Gentlemen, you have a calling, and as we've seen, the world needs you to be a dad because you've produced a tiny human or multiple tiny humans, and you're going to unleash them in the world. So they need you. The world needs you. The church needs you to fulfill that role because you're the only one who can fulfill that role as their dad. Others can be surrogate spiritual fathers, and they need them too, but you can only fulfill that role. And so I ask you, what are you going to do to cultivate the virtues you need so that you can give what God has given to you. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. Again, as we are able to wrap our minds around these things, as we, we see this call that we have, as we, we understand that you've given us this life to live well, that this life is not about the career. The life is not about all these external things that if, if all we do is just sit and be good people, if we just live as good people, then it's a life well lived. We need fathers who, who don't so much know how to climb the corporate ladder, but they know how to stand tall as a dad. We need moms who can stand beside, who are those mothers of virtue, who can stand and show this is what a godly woman looks like. We need parents who can raise up these children, for this is the reason you have created the family. Your word says in Malachi, you have given us, you have given the parents for the purpose of raising godly children. But we can't do it if we ourselves are corrupted in our own soul, filled with vices. Help us to be changed from the inside. Peter reminds us, your Holy Spirit gives us everything we need for godliness and righteous living. So we've got it. But help us, Lord, to manifest it. May it begin with our character, that we will be able to show and with our words such that we will teach. And maybe when our children look up to us with adoring eyes, that they will desire to be like mom and dad and they will seek to fill those shoes. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.